that are not moving in the game. Uh, but you know any of those objects, which makes sense. If you have a wall and it's and lighting is being affected on it, if that wall moves, you don't want that lighting information to move unless the light moves with it. You know, like a shadow is not going to move. In case stuck on a wall like a yeah. decal, so it makes sense. So basically, you just mark your objects as static, and then the global illumination will automatically pick up on those objects. And by marking them as static, like on my screen here, uh, notice on any game object here in the upper right hand corner. Let's go ahead and just click on like this guy. Notice the static checkbox there, and there's a bunch of different types of static. Yes. Um, so, Mark, you're talking about light map static. Yep. And then there's also um, there's we're going to talk about navigation static today. So yeah, there's a bunch of different static types in there. Uh, with global illumination, the idea is you're in a room, mm -hmm. red couch. Yep. How sunlight is interacting with materials in that room, and like you said, kind of uh, not emitting but affecting everything else around it, right? Yeah, it's giving off, you know, it's receiving energy, it's bouncing that energy back off, and now we're taking advantage of that energy. Now, this is a little tip because I've come across this in development. Uh, as you change things in Unity Scene, and you might uh, even see this as Mark's going through a demo here, Unity will constantly uh, recalculate this information while you're designing your game. Uh, it, as soon as you play your game, it stops that calculation process and then resumes again uh, until it finishes. That's a lot of information. It can make your system, I'm, I'm always running with just a few gigs left on my system. Uh, <laughs> I always need bigger hard drives, and uh, of course when I get bigger ones, I, I fill them up and then run out of space. So I'm always clearing stuff off, and uh, this cache can get pretty large. And if you look inside of Unity here, under Edit, Preferences, GI Cache, Clean Cache, and it says right now, actually my, my cache is right now 6 gigs just about. Maximum cache size is 10 gigs. So. Uh, just a little helper thing that they've added now to be able to clean that, reclaim a little bit of space on there. Just because it's helped me because I'm always running out of space. I'm sure a few of you uh, that are listening to this <laughs> are and probably like me with that. You know, with that in mind, I mean, that, that cache being that large just shows you how much data that it's actually computing, it's writing, it's yeah. calculating to figure these things out. So it is a lot there. If you're wondering why, you know, sometimes when you're using some of this lighting techniques, it takes a while to bake that information in. It's got to not only, it's not only got to write all that data, it's got to actually process all that data and create that data. So it is a lot of, a lot of, a uh, lot of stuff. Now, when we look at um, something like lighting going on around a room, PBR and global illumination, uh, one of the things that you kind of expect to see are reflections, yes. right? You have objects that you, you hope, if they're metallic, not even metallic, but it, some sort of reflective value to them that the environment itself is going to kind of reflect onto it. And so in order to do that inside of Unity, that you need refre <laughs> not refraction probes, <laughs> reflection probes. Uh, and these essentially are needed if you want to reflect a texture. Uh, Unity will actually show you color lights without having a reflection probe. So if I have like a metallic sphere and a, a green light below and a red light up top, I'll see those colors on my sphere. But if you really want to reflect textures, like the inside of a cave, for example, you need a reflection probe set up. And you're not really, you know, if you're just shining a color on an object, you're not really reflecting the light. You're actually just shining the light on there. Once you make Point, it reflective, yep. then we need, then we need to actually tell Unity what you want to reflect. Um, you could fire rays infinitely, and at some point you want to tell it, hey, you know, just reflect this environment, this part of the area. And these are for reflecting static objects? Uh, any objects. Any objects. Any objects. Cool. All right, let's look at some lighting settings. Mark, you want to take us through a couple uh, cool lighting settings? Sure, absolutely. So, um, see what we're looking at here. I just sort of uh, just stripped it down a little bit. Just want to show you again some lighting stuff. So, what we have going on here, uh, we have our cave. And in the back of the cave, I've got a few point lights set up. And if I actually just select all these point lights and turn them off, you can see the lights go dark and the lights come back on. So, no big deal there, you know, just standard lighting. Uh, right now, I've got this set to real-time mode, so I could bake these into the texture map of the cave if I wanted to. But what I'll show you instead is I'm going to turn that off. And I've already set the cave up here to be static. So it's already computed the light map for it. Um, so therefore, if I go and just grab a couple spheres, and I'm just going to select these and turn them on, you can see I basically got a couple spheres here. And now you can see here the bottom right corner of my screen, it's actually now computing the light map for these spheres on here. And you can see just how long this is going to take. It's not too terribly painful, but again, it is doing a lot of calculation. It's creating an entire light map. Uh, and once this is done, you'll see the results are pretty slick. Uh, it doesn't just compute it, and then you can't tweak it anymore. So you can see right now it computed that light map. This has no performance hit anymore on the GPU, whereas before our other light sources, you know, the more light sources you add, your frame rate starts to suffer. And now here, you have no impact at all. But we actually still see these fears. So I'm going to show you a couple little tricks. Uh, one, if we just open up our standard shader, 
And you can see I'm using the, um, the non-specular setup, so I have control over my metallic and my smoothness. I have them set up to be shiny. This doesn't matter at all for this because these are actually gonna be invisible by the time I'm done with them. Uh, I'm just gonna turn those off. But what I can do here is change the color. So right now I'm emitting this HDRI value. Um, this is our new color picker for, um, for uh, emissive values. You can see it uses actually an HDRI type of a, of a setup. And as I move this around, you can see that the lighting in my environment completely changes. I can change the mm. color like so. Uh, obviously, I can change the intensity if I want. So if we go back here to say like a blue, let's get it something that sort of match what we had before. Uh, I can actually change the value of this, of this emissive value. And here's a little tip for those of you that don't know. If you hover your mouse to the right uh, or to the left or right of any of these value boxes here, if they don't have a slider, it gives you actually a virtual slider. See how my mouse just changes that icon? So now if I hold my left mouse button down, I can kind of scrub left and right. And you can also do uh, this, just go right completely past the right going. side of the screen and just keep going. You can First go, time I saw that, I was go. like, what? <laughs> yeah, pretty slick, huh? And there is a limit to the uh, the maximum value that the emissive will give you. Uh, but you can animate this. You can make a cool, like, you know, like we have here, a glowing kind of a hallway, throw a script on there that'll animate that. Uh, another really cool trick is to actually just turn off you know, in the old days, we'd call it a primary raise, but I want to turn off, you know, I don't want to see those spheres. That looks kind of weird. So what I'll do is just go back to my, um, back to my, my uh, shader here. I'm going to set the rendering mode to cut out and then click on the albedo color. And down here at the bottom, this alpha channel slider, as soon as it's below 50%, boop, it disappears. And now if I unselect my spheres, they're gone, but that contribution is still there. So I can select it. I can still go tweak the amount of emissive value that's in there and then unselect it and that sphere then hides. So a really cool way of creating lights. There's no overhead on this at all. Uh, and you, you say that was on the albedo cutting out the... Uh, yeah, the I'll show you that again. Alpha? A lot of uh, a lot of people try to use this slider here, the alpha cutoff. It's not. You actually have to set this to cut out, click on the albedo color, and set your alpha channel down here to something below 50%. It's either hmm. on or off um, when you're using 50 this. 50% is that, that magic value. That is the magic value. And I'm going to tone that down a little bit because it's a bit oh, ridiculous. There we go. Uh, another cool thing we can do is set up things like bounce cards. So what I've done here is I've, I've put a, uh, an object, which I need to turn on here real quick. And right now you can see it's missing its texture map or its, its material color. If you're familiar with Unity, you know that, that, uh, that purple color right there tells you, hey, something's missing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new material. So I'm just going to say game object, create material. And here I'm just going to give it, say, a color. We'll make this maybe red. And I'll also set the emissive color to red, like so. And everything looks good there. Maybe give this a name. So I'll rename this to red or whatever. It's not really that important, but I'll call this red emissive, like so. And now if I drag and drop this material onto here, we should start to see a little bit of red spilling in there. Now I haven't cranked up my emissive value, but if I do, look at that. Now I've got a cool, nice glowing hallway that's actually getting it from that hole in the ceiling right there. So it's really a nice way to, to uh, create fill lighting. Like, you know, if you want a, a nice uh, daytime or a nighttime look to a scene, put a couple of blue dark uh, bounce cars outside and you get that nice spill coming in like so. Uh, another thing that we can do, which is pretty slick, is uh, use um, reflection probes. Let me talk about those real quick. So we have these little coins here, if I could set my camera properly, there we go. Uh, so if I hit play on our, on our little game here, we can see I've got, uh, these little coins as soon as it starts playing. Give it a second, there we go. So you can see we got these little coins on here. And currently there's no reflection on them, they're just sort of static, but they are gold, so why don't we make them, uh, why don't we make them reflective? So what I'll do here is create a game object, and reflection probes are under the light parameters. So I'm gonna click on reflection probe here, and it created my probe kind of out there like so. So I'm just gonna bring this in. Now the way these probes work, uh, there's a little bit of a thought process that goes into this. You need to set this cube to a certain size that's going to capture your environment that you want. You can actually see what it's capturing right here. And what it does is it basically creates, and if you zoom in, you can actually see this, it creates a um, basically a texture map that it reprojects as a, as a texture projection on all of your reflective objects. So whatever this sphere is showing right here is what's going to be projected on there. So this just gets baked as well. So it's not, it's not very intensive. It's not very CPU or GPU um, expensive or whatever you want to call that. Uh, the performance, it's not very, very great. But what you do want to do is you want to scale these, these reflection probes so that they encompass what you're looking for. And I actually said the wrong word there. I said scale. You really actually need to use these little dots here to, to, uh, to actually grab your reflection probe and scale it. And you can see that every time I make a change, it'll update here in the probe once it finishes baking that. So 
Let's let the, give that a second. And maybe I'll just pull this back a little bit like so. And I'm gonna also bring this into my, um, into my cave here. So you have to click this little, little icon right there. So we click that. I'm gonna bring this out like so. And now if I go spin this camera around, and we take a look at our materials that are on the coin. Let's just frame up on this guy. Uh, right now, the material doesn't have any metallicness or smoothness to it. So I want this to be gold, so that's definitely going to be 100% on the metallic side. And then I could look up on the chart to find out what the actual value is for gold. It's probably somewhere in the, in the 6.6 or so. Let's just hit play and see what that looks like. And look, now we've got a nice, shiny gold um, environment that's actually reflecting the environment that we see here in our scene. Um, you may wonder why the ones in the back there were dark. They're still not reflecting anything. The reason for that is whatever is inside of your reflection probe, this box right here, that is the only things that will be reflective. So it actually, as soon as you leave this area, if nope. you have a reflective object, nothing. nothing. So if I press play again and go forward, let's just do that and we'll jump, you can see that these are now reflecting nothing. So I've cranked them up to be highly reflective, uh, to be metallic, but they've got nothing to reflect. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna select our reflection probe, Control D to duplicate it, and I'm just gonna slide it down the road a little bit here. And you can see it's actually gonna bake now a new reflection probe, and I'm gonna select both of them here at the same time and just show you a neat little, uh, a neat little concept. If you overlap them, they will actually blend between the two probes. Uh, and you can actually click on any object in your scene and it'll tell you what do you want to blend uh, when you go between two probes. <clears throat> so you can tell it the probes and the skybox if you want to include the outside environment um, or just completely turn it off or have a nice blend. Hmm. So we won't really see that too well with this example, so I'm gonna do something here in a second. But now you can see we've got some shininess going on on both, um, on both of our probes, or on all of our coins, rather. <clears throat> so what I've also done is, just to show you uh, something else here, it's pretty slick. I've got a, on my, uh, on my character controller, I've got an object here called the bazooka. And this bazooka is somewhat famous in the Unity lore. It's the, it's the standard bazooka from the asset store. Uh, so if I press play, and we just kind of walk through this environment. You can see it's not reflective at all. So I'm gonna go and just stop that really quick. Select my bazooka. I've got the standard shader on it, and I'm just gonna crank the metallicness up. I'm gonna crank the smoothness up. Beautiful. Beautiful. Look at that. It's getting our, it's getting our, our, our shininess there, but you can see it's not actually sliding the textures. It's reflecting, and you can see it doesn't quite look right. Well, the reason for that is uh, if you don't have this setting on your reflection probe called box, uh, box projection set, it doesn't, it doesn't slide the image past the, past the uh, reflection. Actually, it's much easier to explain than to show. So I'm just going to select both my reflection probes and turn on box projection. Uh, without this turned on, it works really well when you have objects that are animating, like this, where they're just rotating around. That's fine. But if you want them to actually appear as though you're sliding through that environment, you have to turn on that setting there. Oh, look at that now. And now Beautiful. you can see it's much more realistic as a slider. Now, I should point out, uh, I can't actually move my mouse and have it move the input just uh, on the way we're projecting today. So otherwise, it'd be a little more dynamic with the, uh, oh, I've just fallen off. <laughs> and you can see once I left that area, we're no longer reflective at all. So you can see it just turns to black. So you need some more reflection probes and uh... <laughs> pummeling to my endless demise, whatever just happened there. So Pretty anyway, cool. yeah, Beautiful. that's a little bit on, uh, on reflection probes and, uh, and those emissive values. Awesome. That, that little trick of setting the cutout and setting that alpha channel, that's really, really good to know. It took me a while to figure that one out, but it's just great that you can populate your scene with those emissive values. Cool. Like that makes that. it beautiful looking. Awesome. Why, thank you. Let's move on next to talk about some animations inside of Unity. They've added a couple new features. Um, Unity supports two animation systems. You've had the legacy support there for a long time. Uh, some folks still use it, but then we've got Mechanem, this awesome animation system, which we're going to look at today. Uh, it uses two components. It uses an animation file and an animation controller. Now we have these animation state behaviors. Uh, previously, if you were doing any kind of uh, anything a little bit more complex with animations, you actually had to call API calls like this to find out what the current state of animations were. Um, and now we can actually use code called animation state behaviors, which we'll look at shortly. Uh, 2D root motion. So root motion is taking an animation and mapping its movement in the physical world to an animation. So for example, if I have a guy doing a zombie walk, um, I don't have to actually move my object. Just the fact that he's doing a zombie walk like that, like this, 
<laughs> is that what you're like doing? Like this. <laughs> just the fact of him walking along like that. Without root motion, he would just be in place. You enable root motion, and it tracks his positioning, and it will actually move him through space. So a uh, really brilliant way to get realistic looking animations. Uh, now there's 2D root, root motion. We're like, well, how, how does that work? Uh, 2D root motion, you basically define an animation uh, for a 2D object, and then it will, uh, it will move that object through space. So we're going to look at some other things today. We are limited on time. Uh, 